Our first guest tonight is one of the best-loved actors you know from some of the best-loved movies ever. His new series, Utopia, is on Amazon Prime Video. Say hello to John Cusack. Hey, John. How are you? Hello, how are you, Good to see Good. you. You have an audience. What's that? Sorry, I... Did... The, I yelled at you the, have an audience. I yelled at the crew um, because they were not responding to my jokes, and now they're over responding to me. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't call them an have audience you, so much as we. Have you played with a yeah. laugh track yet, or no? No, did no. You have, did you have to do a laugh? No track? laugh track, but we're this close. We're real close. <laughs> I might be the guy. There's a laugh track. <laughs> I would appreciate it. I could use all the help I could get. Hey, by the way, um, I know it was a few months back, but. I enjoyed seeing you in The Last Dance, the Michael Jordan documentary, talking about uh, Michael and the Bulls, and that, just as a fan. And you're a lo you're a longtime fan, obviously. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I was a uh, I was lucky enough to grow up in Chicago when Jordan first came into the league and watch his rise and watch him kind of conquer the Detroit Pistons and then start his reign as the best basketball player ever, with all due respect to LeBron and all the others. I just, there's never been anybody like Michael. So it was a, it in was your a mind, great time in Chicago sports. In your mind, is there any possibility that LeBron could surpass Michael? Like, say, if LeBron were to win four more titles, would he pass Jordan? They're all so good. It's just the, the, the thing for me, um, which I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but, like, hockey used to be a lot tougher. Like, they used to fight all the time right. hockey. And when Michael was coming up, if somebody went into the paint to try to get above the rim, like, Anthony Mason was going to hit you and you were going to go down. So it was a lot tougher game. So I just remember that. And so it makes his accomplishments, to me, seem even more incredible. You became friendly with Michael Jordan. Are you? Would you say he's a friend of yours, an acquaintance? How would you... you... I would say so. Yeah. I would say, yeah, I would yeah. say, yeah, it's, uh, I would say he's, you know, acquaintance, friend, uh, Chicago guys. What does that mean? Like, do you hang out together? Do you go places? Do you meet places? Yeah, um, you know, we went out a couple times, um, um, and back then, it was a time when there was no, um, you know, cell phones. Yes. And there were no pictures, so you could kind of get lost in a bar pretty, pretty well. Uh -huh. And so if you could roughhouse with guys like that. So I went out one night with Jordan and, um, and let's see, the Super Bowl MVP, Richard Dent. And they started roughhousing. And, and uh, before I knew it, Richard Dent had lifted me over his head with one arm. Really? I have, yeah. I thought he might have thrown me through the ceiling. <laughs> I thought it was, you know... At great peril when you... Were Did you do anything to earn that, or was he just... Was it just a feat of strength? It was just sort of a little bit of roughhousing and alcohol with people that were really big and strong. <laughs> <laughs> when you talk to Michael Jordan, I'm, I, you know, I'm just interested in your friendship because I think you are a Chicago icon in a similar way that he is. Um, no, 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 no. Yeah, but you are. I mean, listen, it's not Michael Jordan, but... I'll tell you one thing. That I, like, I, for me, I'm just a, like I just fan out and I geek out, right? So I say, Michael, who is the toughest? Uh, here's a question: If you asked who is the toughest person to defend against the great Michael Jordan in his whole career, who would he answer without a split second? Who is his answer? Interesting. Uh, God, I don't know. Yeah, who did he answer? He, without a second's hesitation, he says Kevin McHale. Kevin Celtics. McHale of the Celtics. Wow, really? We're talking about old school, yeah. yeah. So I, I would just, you know, geek out with that stuff. And, and was Kevin McHale even on Jordan a lot, I wonder? Or maybe there was just one no, bad remember incident? When he, I mean, when he first scored, I think, 63 or 70 points against the Celtics back when Larry Bird and Parrish and McHale was on that team, um, he said that he was... That's why he developed his fadeaway jump shot, I think, was to get away from Kevin McHale. Wow, that's... Wow, that's... Uh... That's got to be exciting for Kevin McHale, I would think, huh? <laughs> I was, I was, I was amazed. And then you know, it's like if you have, if in, in Chicago, if you hang out, and we, I used to hang out and we pick Greg Maddox Brain, who was the great pitcher. Of and course. Said, what do I? What, what can you tell me that no one knows about your Hall of Fame career? And he said, I want to give up the most O2 hits in history. I'm never wasting that O2 pitch. Wow. So just. Geek. Well, he's from my hometown of Las Vegas, uh, Greg Maddox, so you're talking my language there. Now, there's a photograph I want to ask you about because this is the last time that Michael and Kobe played against each other in a game. Michael was with the Wizards, and there you are, the big gulp or something in your hand. Yeah, it is a big gulp. And everyone's <laughs> laughing. And what, do you remember anything about this moment? I know it's just something that, that was snapped and 
Maybe you don't. No, but. of course I remember. I remember. I, I remember every game that I think Michael played and, and all of it. And then when he came back with the Wizards, I would go to as many as I could. And he'd go off of the bench, and I'd say, "Come back in." He would say, "No, no, no, I'm done." He <laughs> ice up his knees. And that moment, some point in the game, everyone knew Michael and Kobe were going to go one on one. So Kobe got the ball. He cleared everybody out, and everybody started to, you know wrestle up with anticipation and it was going to be Kobe against Michael and Kobe started to drive. Michael stepped in front of him, right in front of me and he took the charge and he went down and Kobe was standing above him and Michael just looked up and he said, well, everybody in the building knew you weren't going to pass. <laughs> and, then, and then there was a pause. <laughs> and it was like, the old pro got him. Like, you know, the, the, uh, the old vet got him and Kobe just started laughing and they both started laughing. But that's what they said there and that's why everybody around <laughs> that's a good that is a great story well you i mean and so you really felt the passing of the torch you know you, one great to the other and you know you felt it was a moment in sports it was really amazing to be in. that is pretty <laughs> great you know um uh i was thinking about this uh the movie high fidelity and i mean so many really some of my favorite movies are your movies thank you sir that is one of them and uh that is as i recall somebody who we now know and love jack black's for, that was his breakout role in, in that film. Did you know Jack before that movie? Yeah, yeah. You know, I was uh, lucky at the time I was making some movies um, with a guy named Joe Roth who ran Disney, and, and so I'd made Gross Point Blank over there, and they had the book, and so he asked me if I wanted to adapt it, and as soon as I read the book, I saw Jack as the, the character, and because I knew something about Jack that no one else knew, I knew how great an actor he was, and he'd been in a few little tiny things, but I knew he was just an unbelievably great actor and hilarious guy. But I also knew that he could sing because I'd seen Tenacious D play, uh -huh. so that was really shocking too. So I felt like I, I felt like he was just the perfect guy for it. So I said, "Come, come do this thing." And he thought Stephen Frears was a little scary at first, but I said, "No, everyone's nice. Come, come do it. Come do it." And so you I'm, actually I, had to talk him into doing it. Well, I think he wanted to make sure we weren't just all crazy, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and did he did he come to that conclusion? <laughs> well, he did the movie, so I think you know. Okay, all right, good, all right. <laughs> yeah. But I think he was happy about it. We, oh, I would hope so. Well, John Cusack is with us. He's got a new show called Utopia on Amazon Prime Video. We'll be right back. We're going to need an emergency use authorization for the nervous suits at the FDA. I know they think they want to put an honest face on this. Well, what's more honest? than a guy who discovered the flu, then cured it. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> but, but we don't even know that, that my vaccine... I'm sorry, I'm just so excited. Can't wait to tell the world we have the flu. We have a vaccine and we can cure our kids. That is John Cusack and Rain Wilson in Utopia. John, uh, what can you tell us about the show that won't uh, reveal too much? Because I'm fearful I might. Well, it's one of those... It's a show with a... It's Gillian Flynn wrote it, um, and I think you know her from um, Gone Girl and yeah. Sharp Objects and many of her novels. And there's a great cast of actors in it, with, like, with Rain and a bunch of other people. And it was based on the British TV show Utopia, but Gillian reimagined it. And it's hard to talk about it because in every episode, whatever you think your assumption is about the show, there's a sort of a trap door, and you feel like you've gone down the rabbit hole and you're into another episode. So... Um, it's um, it's hard to talk about, but because you don't want to spoil. Yeah. yeah, it's got a lot of um, it's got a lot of dystopic, utopian themes, and it uh, kind of in a surreal way parallels a lot of the crazy troubles. Now, I assume that you shot this before COVID, and that that is yes. a coincidence. Yeah, yes, and that of was course. coincidence and eerie and sort of surreal. Yeah. Do you think that's a coincidence that helps the show, or makes it, uh, or not? I don't know. I mean, it's. Um, I don't know. I, I, it, it's it's one of those things where it just uh, the theme, if you're do doing kind of dystopic themes and you're talking about climate change and pandemics and global warming and endless wars and all the kind of insanities of modern uh, life, then it's kind of hard to avoid that. But um, we certainly didn't you know, think it was going to be looking out the window and we didn't think we were going to have a pandemic around us. What, John, is what's life like in Chicago right now? Chicago is... Um, you know, it depends on where you are, but, you know, there, there were some boarded up buildings um, from some of the riots and things like that. And some businesses are boarded up. But, so it, it sort of comes and goes. But um, people are eating outside and um, I think trying to, you know, everybody's wearing masks, thank God. 
Have you voted yet, or did you just throw your ballot in the river? No, sir. No. I did. I did vote. I voted for. I, I guess you could probably imagine who I voted for. Well, you know, I know you were a, a real, a very um, vocal Bernie Sanders supporter. Senator Sanders, I think, he has a concern. I spoke to him about it a couple of weeks ago that some of his biggest backers might not vote for Joe Biden. Um, yeah. So what do you say to that? Well, what I say is, is um, you know, when a person respects you, they tell you the truth. And I've known Sanders for a long time, and Bernie didn't lie to anybody, you know, so he respects everybody and he tells them the truth. And he says that um, he's gotten some concessions from Biden. Is it as much as all the progressives want? Absolutely not. But when you look at the alternative, you know, which is, can Bernie and the progressives move the Democratic Party towards kind of a New Deal center, like going back to the FDR days, including race and intersectionality and economic justice, or you get fascism with Trump, where it's just lawless. So I think when Bernie says um, we're going to have progressive um, movement with this with this administration, I think he's telling you the truth. And I think you can trust Bernie. And he's announced that he'll be in charge of health care, which I think you were so fantastic to use your platform to help people. Um, oh, well, thank you for saying that. Well, well I mean, it, it's, you know, you took a risk and, 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 and you did it from your heart. But um, I think what he said, he's going to be in charge of, of health care reform and that Biden has made that commitment to him. So even if you can't get along with Biden, if you know that Bernie's going to be in charge of expanding health care, pull the lever. You know, I mean, yeah. it might not be what you want right away, but it's going to be, you know, I think you have to, you, you have to vote out Trump. Well, thanks, John. I'm care. always you interested care. in what you're up to and what you have to say. John's show is called Utopia. It's on Amazon Prime Video right now. John Cusack, everybody. Thanks, John. We'll be back with Leslie Jones. Thanks for watching. If you liked that video, click the subscribe button. And if you didn't like it, well, you hurt my feelings.